welcome. I am here with Joe Hawley today. Hello Joe Hawley. again. Yes. <laughs> um, what first got you interested in working in music? Uh, I've always enjoyed listening to music, and uh, when I was a kid, I liked, you know, musicals, Beatles, and Queen. Mostly bands that never that didn't exist anymore for some reason. When uh, our family went uh, to Hawaii in the summer of 1997, um, I heard this music in my mind, and I knew that I had to make it at some point. Um, and in college, you know, started getting into making cover recordings with a friend over the summer. Just sort of a hobby. I had piano lessons in elementary school, and then my teacher moved to Korea. My parents bought me a guitar for good grades when I was about sixteen. So you, you've been a, you've had a few different musical projects throughout the course of your career. Uh, do you have one in particular that you're especially fond of? Well, uh, Mirakuru Musicaru was the dream project. It was sort of what inspired me to get into making musical recordings. I studied film in college, and specifically screenwriting. So the the plan was to study film, maybe get a job as an underwater videographer or one of the camera people for Discovery Channel or something like that. Something anonymous uh, would have pleased me. Um, Rob's band started doing well, um, so that was kind of a surprise. And the whole time we were making Tally Hall songs, I knew that in the back of my mind there was this magic project that had to happen, but it wasn't clear how uh, that would manifest. And um, I can't say it's my favorite because it's difficult to pick a favorite. Um, one would hope that all output would be of authentic value and different people project different ideas upon what they how they identify with different subjects, right? They're also representative of different times in a person's life. They're all kind of autobiographical in a way. Same with screenwriting. Even if I found it in fiction writing and screenwriting, I found I was trying to write fiction. It always t turned out to be kind of autobiographical, even if it was unintentional. You, you mentioned your Miracle Musical. Uh, and there was just one album with that, right? Hawaii Part 2. After the band toured in 2011, for what some are saying is the last time, but I think that's unlikely. I think the band will in this lifetime tour again. Um, I was living in a semi-truck garage for about four months, and then I had to go to my Uncle Tom's farm in Otisville, Michigan. I was working in exchange for room and board the year of 2012. And uh, fortunately, they had Wi-Fi there, and I thought, well, now's probably the time to start working on this mystery project. I didn't know what to call it. I didn't want it to be about me. So I bought uh, HawaiiParty.com and posted a countdown to 9-11, because I guess to me at the time, it seemed sort of like an emergency situation. Why, you know, I didn't want to spend the rest of my life working as a laborer on a farm, although it was, the hospitality was greatly appreciated. Um, and then over the course of the year, I'd work on the album by day, and then by night, I would interface with Ross Fetterman of Tally Hall and Bora Karaja. Um, we put this project together, released variations on a cloud on 9-11, but the rest of the album, it, I don't, it's tough to even call it an album. It's sort of like a hologram video game musical ride that may at one point take place in Hawaii um, for those who are willing to make it a priority and succumb to the adventure. Um, and we released the rest of it in December of the same year. Do you plan to do anything else with that project? And I, you just you released the vinyl sort of recently, and I believe mentioned that you maybe want to do something else with it. Are there any plans for that? Well, there is kind of a, a subtextual 9-11 theme, and I've been calling it almost a World Trade Center musical, which may seem weird, and I'm not even sure I understand how it works yet. But it wouldn't just be about the horrific events that occurred at the World Trade Center. It would be about the 
place itself in the history of maybe even New York commerce as a whole. And there could be nameless characters in this story and somehow Hawaii is involved. But it's an abstract narrative, which is part of what makes it interesting because different people have different ideas of what it is. But it would be a challenge to write, say, the other tower. We have had some conversations about that, assuming Hawaii Part 2 is one of the two twin towers. Uh, as a metaphor, what would the other tower sound like? Um, but it certainly wouldn't be called Hawaii Part 1, and we're not going to make Hawaii Part 3, so please stop asking. And also, um, you know, Part 2 can also mean the parting of two souls, as in some kind of romance. And at the time, I was still very much in romantic mode, whereas that is since somewhat subsided. That's very interesting. I definitely hadn't thought about it in that way before, but it does make sense. Um, moving on to your, your self-titled album, Joe Holly. Um, you... That's Joe Holly, Joe Holly. Yes, no, of course. Not to be confrontational. Um, you recently released that on Spotify, but it was, in fact, entirely backwards. Is okay. there any specific reason for that? Um, I'm nervous about releasing this album, which com we completed in 2016. I say we because I work with, closely with the people at Assemble in Detroit. Um, and the band's former management company, Hornblow, in Nyack, New York. Initially, they said, go ahead and make this record with as many samples as you'd like and just keep track of them. Well, about halfway through the production process, that tune changed and it was too late for me to go back and change everything with the samples. So I had to release it with the samples, but it was also, you know, kind of an illegal album. And I guess maybe I'm a little bit more apprehensive about releasing content Although you see people doing that all the time, girl talk, mashups, things like that. Um, so maybe I'll release it. I, I did also receive a legal threat uh, worth lots of money that I don't have as soon as the album dropped, if you want to call it that, in 2016. But it would be nice to, s to see the normal album as it is on Spotify, although the song Aristotle's Denial would be in reverse because it's forwards on the reverse version of the album. So we had to make a slight adjustment for that song, which is, I think is apropos. Maybe you agree. <laughs> Aristotle might've been an interesting character to know in person. Sometimes interesting to think about people like that. <laughs> um, it's, it's, we need to use cameras. It seems to be sort of a theme that occurs here and there, like backwards music it shows up in like the mind electric it's there's a part of me that kind of wants to undo all the music that i make anyway i, I often think would if if i weren't me would i enjoy listening to this music and um at first the answer was a resounding yes and then for a while it became no i'm not sure if i would like this and then now it's kind of i'm, I'm at peace with being an artist who's creating things that aren't perfect all the time but i'd like i mean i'm, I'm aiming for perfection there's no such thing as it if it exists, it's going to be imperfect. Although Bill and Ted 3 is being produced as we speak, and it's possible that will be a perfect movie. We don't know. That's very true. Because we're talking about historical figures and cameras and things like that. But, you know, what? Maybe, maybe they've tapped into some other dimension of perfection. Sort of going back, you mentioned a lot of people worked on Joe Holly, Joe Holly. Um, how do you decide who you'd like to collaborate with? Is there a specific process you go through or because you've done a lot of different collaborations once I commit to a project I think about the people that I know and I inquire um, with some of them about how to proceed with collaboration but given what happened in 2016 it might be difficult to reestablish trust with other artists because the album hasn't been released. So a lot of people are probably thinking, well, what was the point of doing that? The album isn't even on iTunes or Spotify. But such is the nature of art, c'est la vie, uh, you create what you create, and maybe people don't even hear it or see it. Uh, and that's authentic, that's coming from a real place. It was sarcastic, the title of the album was sarcastic. Hawaii part two is all about, uh, walking out of the spotlight and this or, or yeah and this project was sort of saying okay I'm Joe Holly I was in a band Joe Holly right like you want to buy me too bad in a way that's maybe why I mean it isn't even on you know 
the internet, somebody's calling this phone, I'm gonna turn off this phone. I mean, this is this conversation is closer to a real life conversation, but in my opinion, real life conversations should have a priority. Um, we need a new book of etiquette for meals, say, when people have their phones on the table. So what's, why is the phone on the table? Is that is that suddenly going to become critical? Manager time. Anyway, it's kind of a bird walk of a conversation. I appreciate your Hawaiian shirt, by the way. Oh, thank you it, very it's much. It's kind of like a pattern shirt. Yeah. It's one of my favorite shirts. <laughs> uh, so Weird Al apparently put on his rider that he wanted Hawaiian shirts at every concert, and he ended up collecting so many of them. I heard this on the Macaulay Culkin podcast, by the way. He ended up collecting so many of them that he had to give them away to Goodwill. Oh, my God. Yeah, there's just a lot of Hawaiian shirts. That's funny. It's fun to imagine having that many Hawaiian shirts. Yes, that's the dream, isn't and, it? And the authority to insist upon them at every gig. But <laughs> you know, it's like that episode of The Simpsons where they say, so you like donuts, have all the donuts in the world. This is Satan in hell who says this to Homer. And not Homer the author, but Homer the character from The Simpsons. Um, and he just can't get enough of the donuts. He just keeps eating the donuts. They're delicious. It's not a problem. Uh, you know, for anybody who enjoys watching The Simpsons out there. The, the, that was an analogy, you know, we're talking about Hawaiian shirts and having all the Hawaiian shirts you could possibly want. I get what you're saying. And maybe it was more of a heck reference, you know, if, you were, if you're one of those gosh believers. Re returning a bit to your, your collaborations, uh, do you have a specific, do you have like a dream collaboration, no matter how plausible it would be? Is there any specific artist you would really love to collaborate with? Uh, I reached out to Joanna Newsom for Hawaii Part 2. I thought maybe it'd be cool. I mean, cool's not the right word for it, but I thought it would be amazing, fantastical, if she would play harp for a song like Stranded Lullaby, but I didn't I didn't hear back from her. And, you know, sometimes I reach out to people and I, I don't hear back from them, and uh, it's sort of like Jake the Snake Roberts, a man can only fail so many times before, you know, it sort of becomes... Uh, a sob story, but I, you know, it, eventually maybe some of these collaborations will make sense um, in the music industry proper. But we do seem to be in the uh, interim phase between television celebrities and internet celebrities, and we haven't. Or, I mean, you know, movie the movie business might be a completely different thing, but we haven't really rectified our obsession with screens in the 20th century. Uh, with like the fact that anybody with a phone can make video content now, you know, it was at, at one point a majestic luxury to be recorded on a screen, and now it's just sort of uh, jejun, as it were. Not that that's a, that's not a complaint. Some, some people like banality. In fact, uh, there's a whole story about it. Um, the college thesis, see. I had a creative writing college thesis, and one of the stories was just the word banality formatted to look like a story. Oh, that's interesting. Which could have been just to meet the page requirement. I was under <laughs> a lot of Sometimes it's just what you got to do. Yep. Yeah, I see. Um, what inspires you? Mm. That's a very broad question, but... There's this dimension of uh, thought that can't be put into words. David Lynch references it in his Catching the Big Fish. Mm. Audiobook is recommended. It's a book, but he, you know, he provides the um, you know, voice for his audiobook. And meditation helped clarify it later, but at first it was very much just hearing or seeing a dimension in something that was inexplicable and it seemed to transcend the physical reality. Um, when I first saw the Beatles in elementary school on the Ed Sullivan show, it was obviously a rerun because I wasn't alive when the Beatles were popular, but that would have been kind of cool. Um, there was this dimension. It was like an – I don't want to say a nightmare dimension. It, there's, there's this subtext to what they're doing you can picture other things happening almost like a dream world 
and and uh, referencing that seems to be the function of art. It's like I saw them as Muppets or something. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. There's something. There's a, the timeless dimension. The timeless dimension. It, it, referencing the timeless is inspiring. Surre surrealism doesn't have to be the goal, although there certainly are um, fantastical things in the mundane. Marvin Yagoda from Marvin's Marvelous Mechanical Museum, the late Marvin, uh, was excellent at finding the magical in the everyday. Sort of going back to your many musical endeavors, do you, if, if something that comes to mind, do you have a, it's your fondest memory of your musical career? Um... It was amazing meeting Rod Argent from the Zombies. That was heady. It was kind of like a, yeah, it felt like a Bill and Ted moment to reference that again. Not that I'm working with the entertainment company that's marketing this, this picture. It's just, it was like one of those time travel moments where, oh, this guy was in the song. She's, he, he was the keyboardist and she's not there. Help, helped write it. Um, and uh, we performed with them in Detroit, which was kind of like one of those dream zones, right? M releasing Hawaii Part Two was something I wasn't sure would happen, and it was nice to have, see that completed. But I think, to be fair, that might even sound even better live if we were ever get to that point, which would be a complicated thing to arrange. But it sounds like it, yeah. Yeah. I, there have been some gratifying musical moments so far, but it, it, you know m there could be many to come in the future, which would be swell. Um, if you weren't working on music, what do you think you would be doing with your life? Do you have any idea? When I was in Florida, I, I mean, I, w I have had another career. I was almost like I was in, I had an alter ego or something. It had nothing to do with music whatsoever, although graphic design work. I'm a juggler, I guess you could say. I want to. I don't want to be a jack, though. I'd like to do somehow maximize my brain to utilize all of its functions at a high level. But uh, I was in the electric transportation business. See, uh, took a leave of absence from University of Miami's MBA program because I found, and I still haven't returned, by the way, which is kind of what makes this tricky. But. Uh, I found a company that makes electric bicycles. My father, electrical contractor. So there's some left brain activity. It, the question is how to uh, reconcile the hemispheres of the mind after writing so many times with the same hand throughout school. You know, I should have switched it up and learned how to write with my left hand for many of these classes because then my brain wouldn't be so wobbly, if that makes sense. In other words, okay, so to answer your question, electric transportation by day, music by night, donezo. And then maybe a few other things on the side. Well, you know, endeavors would be fun. That's fair. Um, what are your current musical goals? Do you have short-term goals or like super long-term goals or anything specific? Uh, I'm working on a couple of covers. In fact, I just finished a cover, but I'm not sure quite how to release it with, with the help of somebody that I know. Um, and, at, at, and Assemble. We, we recorded some, you know, some of it at Assemble. Um, and I have some tally songs, you know, uh, and I think that they are going to be released at some point. The question is how. The third album is quite clear, at least to my mind, but one can't be too forceful in making these assessments when dealing with a group of five people. Everybody has to agree upon the vision, and that is certainly challenging. Um, because everybody has ideas of what they want it to be. But I would like to see the third Tally Hall album produced and released within the next couple of years, say. But I may be alone in that sentiment. We'll see. Yeah, it does. It seems like everyone sort of went off and they all seem very successful. <laughs> They're going off in their different directions. Right, they do. But um, it's 
it's not up to a person when music arrives in the mind. It's like I was in my parents' kitchen a couple years ago and like this fully formed ragtime melody just arrived. I didn't ask for it. I don't know why it's there. It's wonderful. Uh, it's going to be like barbershop with drums. I mean, it, it's it's happening, but I can't make it by myself, right? And also there are personal conflicts and differences of opinion. Uh, and as Andrew said, you know, about 20 minutes ago, he's talking to people, uh, we all have um, personal lives and it, it probably isn't safe to get into that. But I would, I would like to see, well, I mean, it should be safe. There's really nothing that, uh, expansive, unless there's something I don't know about other people, but um, it should be fine. You know, we should be able to make a third album without a problem. I mean, it's not like we're going around creating too many fusses and musses. Well, definitely, I hope that works out for you. I think it would be very well received by the band's fans. I'm sure it'd be fun. Last question I wanted to ask you. What do you think true happiness looks like for you personally? Meditation has really helped with um, staying stable, at least in light of some very difficult circumstances. I don't know if I'm under more pressure for some long-term reason, but uh, for, for whatever reason, I feel that my, my personal life has been under more pressure and more scrutinized um, in a way that yes, has resulted in a lot of stress and it would be nice to just be able to breathe and relax and feel comfortable. But, um, I had this college girlfriend that really did a number on me, just to be honest. And that, that affected my happiness quite a bit. Uh, and it still does. So in the long run, it would be great to resolve some of that, um, somehow, but I, I can't really talk about what an ideal situation would be. Maybe ice cream on a unicycle. It's a pretty reasonable. It's very simple. You know, just ice cream on so go to Belle Isle. Maybe take a, go for a dip in the, uh, in the Detroit River. I, w I heard, uh, this may seem off base, but I, it sounded like a beluga whale in the Detroit River, 2017. A seagull caught my eye, see? Said, check it out. There's a beluga whale there. Wow. It's just going to breeze right past it on the bicycle. But it's fresh water. And what's a beluga whale doing in Detroit anyway? It's a good point. It seemed like, it sounded just like a whale. It sm there was a salty smell to the air. The seagull gave me a knowing um, gaze with its countenance. It, it seemed to know something I didn't. And what it knew was that there was a beluga whale in the Detroit River. Wow. But I can't prove it. And I should have I should have thought to use my video camera at the time, but it just didn't occur to me for whatever reason. Well, you have the memory, at least. And I could be, yeah, it could be delusion. I, I, you know, I think, you know, the mark of somebody who's truly out of touch with reality is they aren't even interested in entertaining the possibility that their creative thoughts are wrong or not based in, you know, some objective reality. But there could be three realities. There could be at least three realities. <laughs> Very true. We'll find out more about that uh, in next week's Casper and the Guests. <laughs> well, that is all I had for you today, but thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Maybe uh, one day we shall meet again. Yes, maybe. Uh, well, or for the first time, depending upon how one defines meeting. This is digital. We were basically talking to uh, glorified toaster ovens. <laughs> That's very true.